love, obviously, of course, being in love, but yeah. you have to worry about playing with you out, out, out here. <laughs> so, um, so to answer your question, um, my inspiration really came from trauma. Um, so mm -hmm. the best way, best I can describe it is my senior year to my freshman year in Hampton involved five of my friends being murdered. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, so I came in my first semester from my senior year, a girl I dated the year before had been stabbed to death by her ex-boyfriend. And then going to spring, uh, a guy named Zach, I was supposed to hang out with and go to class trip with and we, we just had a lot of fun the day before. Yeah. Called to an assembly, he had been shot three times in mm -hmm. the deli. Um, so then I come around to Hampton, I'm thinking it's a fresh start, I'm leaving DC. I get to Hampton and, and one of the guys, I actually one of my class trip with, his name's Desi, really cool dude, stole somebody's shoe at the club and they killed him for it. And yeah, it was just crazy. And then coming around to the spring, uh, one of my friends I grew up with, I know Mike since I was like six years old. And he had this girlfriend and we were all like, who is this girl? Because Mike didn't stay with nobody for more than 30 days. <laughs> Two minutes. Yeah, it was like, who is this girl? And then she had to get shot in the head oh, um, no. because, because she witnessed a murder. And so they wanted to get rid of the witness. And right. then when I came back from my sophomore year, uh, my friend from church, Jamie, he had been shot in a drive-by. So that was my experience my senior year and freshman year in Hampton. And obviously, I was suffering from undiagnosed PTSD. Sure. Um, and in a lot of different ways, it kind of threw me off track in some ways because I was so good at so many things. And if you don't know a lot about PTSD, it, it takes away a lot of your confidence, takes a lot of your ability to retain information and things like yeah. that. But what it did give me was purpose. And I had to figure out why were black kids killing black kids, right? Mm -hmm. That became a strong push for me because you hear the two things all the time. It's race or it's parenting. Mm -hmm. You hear those two things all the time. Uh, both are incorrect, actually. Um, I knew it wasn't race because I was at Hampton University. And there were literally thousands of young black people interacting every single day. No violence, no issues, no things going on. You have things pop off the club every now and then, but nothing actually on campus. Right. And and that's happening not just at Hampton, it's happening at the Howard and Morehouse and all over the country. So there are literally hundreds of thousands of black people interacting every single day without incident. Right. So it couldn't be race. And then the parenting side, I grew up with these guys. You're like, my best friend who went to jail and I went to college, his mom had the same as my mom had. You know, she didn't play, she disciplined him and expected, expected more from him. Right. And when I, when I realized the difference was my mom is still self worth in me though. There's such a self worth that I was more than my surroundings. I was more than what my friends were doing. And she wasn't able to do the same thing for him. Mm. So then that became my mission now. Now how do I create products that can help parents and still self worth in their children? Because everybody had a skill set as a parent to do that. So they don't need some help. And right. so um, and that's where my first book came from, which was the Just Like Me series. And that was designed to teach black history from 6000 BC up until now. Um, mm -hmm. And wanted to cover how black people were such a part of scientific discoveries. Because, you know, we get the sports, we get Martin Luther King, get all the, I call them the famous five. You know, you, you go through and you hear them over and over again. And that's kind of where it stays. Right. Um, but I want to talk about how we create mathematics and we're the first doctors in the world. And the pyramids is still a, a scientific wonder. They can't rebuild the pyramid. They still don't understand how they were built. And so I wanted to share those types of things with our kids in a fun activity. And when I tell you the response, like I wasn't ready for it. And wow. so I, I went into Southeast with my first book. Um, yep. You know, you've been DC. And when you, know, you say Southeast, Southeast is DC, right? Yes, I'm we, sorry. We may have people watching or from different uh, yeah, areas. Thank you for that. Yeah, that, yeah uh -huh. Southeast DC. Uh, if you don't know DC, Southeast DC is considered one of the worst areas in DC area. Mm -hmm. And so um, I went in there and I spent six weeks with the kids there, went through the books and the letters they wrote me afterwards about how inspired they were and how they want to do better in school and how they feel like they can do something with their lives now. And that just really told me how much these kids needed these kind of tools. Yeah. And we took those uh, testimonials and made a media kit and we ended up on CBS and BET and that's kind of how the whole thing got started. Wow. 
And, and just let me ask you, and this is helpful for any audience watching, when you say putting a media kit, was that you personally or you hired a publicist to kind of do that and send out your book? What was that like for you? In other words, did they ask you, did you have an agent representing you or were you kind of able to do that yourself and kind of represent yourself? With great, great question. And the question is, everything is done myself with some friends. Wow. Um, so I'm big on researching and learning things. And so there are, before the internet was, there was a thing called a library. I know a lot of people are not familiar with the library anymore, but it, there's a this building with books in them. Um, and I know, Should right? Be, uh, the library has always been free. It's right? always been free. Yeah. And so I learned how, I learned what a media kit was. Um, I learned how to put one together um, and what was needed. And you write it from a standpoint of the reporter's viewpoint, not your own. Mm. So, because they have a job to do. Their job is to put stories out and find things of interest to their audience. So I had to put it in a way that if a reporter read this, they would say, oh, this is a great story for my audience. And so that's what we did. Um, and we began to really, everything essentially was self-taught. Um, I didn't go to school for English. Um, my mom's a teacher. Uh, I th shout out to my mom. My mom was uh, the best mom I could have ever had. That means you uh, were in school year round. I know from being from a family of educators, just because you're, even if, even if you weren't like you know in school like in your you know constantly paying attention you had school at home always <laughs> you nice. had the books and the constant lessons and the constant the history and you know so i yeah. i feel you on that yeah so she she taught 31 years in dc public schools wow and yeah so she's a true uh soldier a champion in a lot of different ways um yeah. but for me i was a math person i love math and she used to make me sit down and write. She said, you're going to need this one day. I said, why do I need English? I'm not going to, I'm, 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 I'm the engineer, I'm going to do. And here I am, an author of three books. <laughs> so my mom was right, I was wrong. So you were um, listening, you were absorbing. I was absorbing. So you um, not, I, if you know my mom, I didn't have a choice. Yeah. So yeah, I, it's just, right. you're going to do it. So, um, and I, again, I appreciate that because if she had not been that stern with me, um, I probably wouldn't be where I am today. I'm not even proud that I wouldn't be here where I am today. Wow. Um, and that's my first black woman that I hold up and say, like, she needs a cake, like for real. Because <laughs> single black mom in the eighties, um, getting me through that process. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what she taught me how to do is learn information, take it in and repurpose it. Okay. Right. That's really what education is really about. Education is really about learning how to learn and how to use that information in another True. format yeah so that was allowing me to write the books self-taught from an author standpoint learn how to do the media kits and then we learn how to get into bookstores okay. because that was a whole yeah, process too so that's a whole nother yeah. thing yeah. and so signing that the is the, i guess you probably went through signing the consignment agreements and the whole what is it 70 30 or 60 40 split and yep. all of that because yep. i used to do a lot of that yep. back in the day yeah. So if you started, when I started, we were one of the first, there wasn't a self-publishing industry when we started. I know at least when I started. It was really brand new. Mm -hmm. And so I remember being one of Ingram's first self-published authors in their program where they actually right. distributed you out really to. Just, yeah, I know I, I have one of my books with Ingram and that that is really new because you used to couldn't get with Ingram unless no. you were already with a traditional house. And then Ingram was always the distributor. Right. That was not open to any indie no. writers at all. No. The librarians all know about Ingram. If you're already, you know, in this system, you know what Ingram is for. But I, I appreciate you mentioning that because that is that that's been the evolution of self-publishing. Ingram and, wanted to probably get in on that money. They saw how many folks were wanting to do the indie publishing, and they're like, "Wow, we've got, we're kind of missing out on some of this here." You didn't. <laughs> Nail on the head, the year before I got into their program, they had missed two indie authors who had sold over a million copies. And right. so they were like, so we're, gonna, we're missing this money, let's get in on this. And so, and if, if your new author is watching, you need to learn these different things because it affects your bottom line. So if you want to get into libraries and schools, you have to be with a distributor. Yep. And Ingram allows you to be listed so you can just order 
from that so system. any organization school college anyone can order that's yep. the first thing a lot of these organizations want to know well who's your distributor yep and like and a lot of me i publish you know my books i can't say lit noir publishing they don't know what lit noir publishing is no, no. but they know what English they sure is. do <laughs> and they're often surprised that you your books are actually there i've had several discussions with people they were like yeah, we can't do anything because you're independent author. I was like, do you have Ingram? He was like, yeah. I was like, yeah, you can go in your system. All my books are there. It changes the game. It changes and it, the game. And, it, and, and uh, unfortunately, but fortunately, unfortunately, it ups your respect quotient yep. with, with the folks who are going to be purchasing your book that are not like friends yep. and family, what have you, the organ, like you say, the school groups, the colleges, the, you know, some of the nonprofits that, you know, they have purchasing order system. There's certain policies and procedures that they have, even for you to be a vendor these days, a vendor, a contractor, depending on who you're working with, what state you live in, um, you know, all these different, a lot of authors, I appreciate you mentioning this, and this is education for aspiring authors or indie authors that you want, because you want more doors open for you, you need to figure out how to get your books listed in these different channels you know it's no longer just amazon or you know what many of us did for so many years that distributor and that that respected name is very important yeah so if you're listening to a new author i think there are three areas you need to focus on the first you need to focus on is your book does it look professional does it look like the books they would buy um in a i guess bookstores now are kind of passe but right you, you want to have the same cover look so whether Random House produced it or you produced it, it should look the same. The second yeah. thing you want to look at is who is your target audience? Like, because a lot of people have great book ideas, but they don't know what audience was well, for everybody. Well, actually, I can understand why you say that, but you need an audience because the first thing I ask you is who is your book for? Right. So you have to understand who your target audience is. Then you have to understand, okay, what's my sales plan and marketing plan? to get this out because yeah. when being a creative a lot of times we think it's so good that people are going to want it and then that's going to be the thing that's not really how it works a lot of times that's why they call it show business because the business side of it really does take precedence over it sure so you need to understand what sells your book and i say you need to have a, a, a 30 second spill and a two minute spill about what you why would somebody want to buy your book? Not why you like the book or why you wrote the book, but why would somebody else? Because everything now, after you've written it, it's about why somebody else would want it. Because that people don't buy because they like you. Your family and friends will buy because they like you. Sure. Your, That's and yourself. I mentioned that. We yeah. have family friends, but then when it comes off of that, then You're, what? You know, then then so, what? And yeah. that plan <laughs> will kick in. That plan will kick in that way because now, when you meet somebody who can't help you, and the worst thing to happen is having somebody who can help you and not being prepared mm. to take advantage of that. And so my goal, whatever room I walk into, I want every possible question I think they can ask already answered and prepared for it. And so now, instead of sounding like you're kind of like this person kind of doing writing, you sound like somebody who has a publishing company who is ready to take the next step. And that's- sure. That's kind of the focus you want to be on. So, yeah, so sure. I, I, I just do a, a class on that. So I can go you all can, day on that. So I don't want to so spend all day we'll, on that. Well, maybe we will have you with a webinar, more like a publishing one-on-one. Yeah. Maybe we can do something like that because I think there's going to be a whole nother tier of writers and authors that would want to get in on something like that, you know. I think that's a good idea. Cause I think um, when I run to people, I run to people who have misconceptions about how, what, writing book, what writing a book means and how to get to be successful. So for example, we talk about Super CJ. How do you get, how do you go from the idea to illustration, to being in bookstores, to now making a cartoon? Those things have steps to them and you have to understand exactly what steps you want to put in place. Mm -hmm. And you gotta be willing to do it because a lot of people think just writing a book is enough. And it's like, if that's for you, that's, if you want to sell though, you gotta have a different mindset. Let's talk about because every you're you're you have a wonderful series and I've checked out some of your videos and and read um, the content online and and your product is beautiful very engaging the colorful with CJ adventures 
um, why the animated series? Why did you feel the need to take it from the book to now this is like video, it's animation? Was that the next step for you, for your particular product? Or did you see that as the next wave with children's publishing that, that all children's authors, especially if you're indie and you are uh, sponsoring yourself, should go toward? Okay, so I'm going to answer that in several levels. One, it was always a part of my plan to go to animation. Um, I wrote my first script in 2003. And we went out to Hollywood to get that turned into a movie. It was called Princess Brianna. Now okay. that name might sound familiar because Disney later made Princess Tiana. Yeah, Princess Tiana, right. Yeah, okay. so uh, we were first. <laughs> it totally rings a bell. When you're saying Brianna, I'm like, uh, it's a fine line. I'm picturing, you know, the Di you know the Disney, and I'm like, hey, wait a minute, was he involved with that? You know. <laughs> and that happened a lot because we came out in '03. The book came out in '04. And here's the funny thing about Princess Brianna. I'll show it again. Princess Brianna, this is my part about celebrating black women. So this book I did came from a discussion I had in Harkness Hall. Uh, late one night, you know, okay. you sit around and start talking. And I, can't, I forgot. Harkness Hall Hampton. on Hampton University's yes. campus. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, Harkness Hall on Hampton University's campus, my freshman year. And uh, the sisters, like, got on this, not a tangent, but on this, like, why don't y'all love us? We was like, well, we love y'all. Yeah. She said, like, they were like, no, why don't you love our noses, our lips, and our hair? Why don't y'all love us? And it got into a really deep conversation, but it made a lot of great points. And I had to step back and say, okay, there's some serious points here that I hadn't really looked at before. Mm -hmm. And am I part of the problem? Because am I mm -hmm. also valuing Eurocentric looks above where we come from, which is African, African noses and lips and hair texture mm -hmm. and as i do some self you know some self an analyzing figuring out okay what are, what's really going on here and then i started realize the damage is done to black women uh, from a young age by not seeing themselves mm. and i was like so at the time i was in prayer about okay what's my next step at that just like me series this i know was god because i was single no children heterosexual male and i wrote a princess mm -hmm. book <laughs> so <laughs> that nothing that, wrong with that. that no, I'm just saying it's wrong. What I'm just saying is that that wasn't my when I when I started to start this business. It was like, yeah, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna write a princess okay. book. <laughs> so what what you're speaking of? You're saying it wasn't maybe the norm. Not that not that it can't be done, but at the time, oh, maybe among your circle, maybe that wasn't the norm. Or you know, I love the way you, you're very good at this, by the way. Because you, you help me rephrase this. I, I appreciate the rephrasing for you. Help me out here. Uh, I just don't want to get. In trouble i don't want to get my live shut down or in i got so you i got you the, the game now is so sensitive with your word choice that right. you know so but but i i hear you and i understand you right right um so to me i wanted to create a product that really celebrated uh how we looked and how we thought mm -hmm. so i created princess brianna and it did really really well i got so much rejection though in the beginning um Black bookstores didn't even want to carry it. And I was like, what do you mean you want to carry it? It's a black princess story. What do you mean you don't want to carry the story? Well, y'all, but black children's books don't sell. And I was like, what do you mean? How long ago was this? Was, when, this when were you? This was 04. Okay, this was so quite some. So we're talking, that's 20 years ago. I've been doing this a long oh time. I've been doing this a long time. So um, I don't know if you remember a bookstore chain called Karibu. Uh, oh yeah, Kariba Books. That yeah. was right here. Matter of fact, that was right here. Yeah. In, in I shouldn't say here. Excuse me. That was around the way. Right. <laughs> in so, the DMV area. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> okay. me and Simba, one of the owners, got really tight, and he was like, "Well, y'all, but I'm not. I'm not doing bringing in the books anymore. We got somebody who does that now. You got to convince her that you know." And I said, "You told me it's gonna be a hard sell because those books aren't moving." That was and a so, beautiful um, chain of bookstores, by the way. When I had it, let me show you real sure. quick. Just see, we got six degrees of separation. So this book, when I published this anthology, my my poetry anthology, I I did a book tour, right? Uh -huh. And I was I was um, I came down from New York, and Caribou Books had 
had me for an afternoon, me and some of my contributors, and we had a real nice book event. I mean, it was one of the top, top, very uh, high quality, yep. very well organized, professional bookstores ever that I had ever been to. I agree with you 100%. And yeah. we became a mainstay because of Princess Brianna. Okay. And so we went inside, and I think I almost had to beg the lady. I was like, just take it. It was the, the week before Black Friday. I remember it was um, November like 17th or 18th, something like that. So maybe less than a week. I was like, please take it, please take it. She was like, I take these books and they don't sell, you better come back and get them. I was like, right. I will. I said, but one condition, can you put it near the register so people can see it? I wow. said, if you put it in the register and people can see it, and if it doesn't sell, then I'll come out and get all of them. Right. When I tell you, they called me three days later and said, we need another what? box of books. Three Wait. days later? How many 50 books, books did you get 50 books, in, 50 books in a case. They Gone. sold all 50 Gone. books. See, that's why I said, when, when you said, because I know when I was a little girl, my parents were buying whatever they could of black children's books. I mean, we had, you know, Anansi and One Snowy Day, and we have, I have Virginia Hamilton, whatever she had out at the time, Z Lee. And so my mom was like the goat in looking for black children, anything with little black girls and black children and children of color, like she was eating up all of that. But it's, it was sad to hear though that you, that you were saying, but I, I get what you're saying because when my, when Alice's musical debut came out, I was once again pounding the pavement to go to different bookstores. I won't name any names. Some took the book and we were able, what I would always do is, well, what I've done in recent years um, is, hey, let's set up a book event. I've mm -hmm. always found that my books a lot of times will sell if I'm there. That way I get to meet people, shake hands, give hugs, and we're doing a signing. But there were a few not naming any names that really didn't want to take the book on and I couldn't figure out why. And and some of them were were stores that were more so geared toward children's books. Right. And I'm like, this is really odd, but maybe to your point, but this was also before the pandemic. Oh yeah. Um, I don't know if there was something going on like as the pandemic was approaching, you know, financially for bookstores, what changes were being made. Um, but yeah, I'm just trying to figure out. So my research just told me that, so a lot of black books at that time period were about personal uh, journeys or like spending time with uncle down south or spending time with grandma. That's right. There weren't, right fantasy books for black kids mm -hmm. back then so mm -hmm. but, but the princess thing was the biggest thing going back then but there were no black princesses that's right. why i knew it that's why i knew it so you knew you so, were in other words you looked at so you were going from a marketing business standpoint looking to fill the gap where is the gap and let me go ahead and fill it as yep. opposed to just primarily i have an idea and it's my inspiration and actually a little bit of both so i have a lot of ideas but it must be a marketing uh part to it that i know i can maximize that gives me leverage in the marketplace okay. and so the first we so we, i took a box of books sometimes two boxes of books for the next six weeks to caribou we became the number one selling children's book in six weeks for the whole year we wow. ranked in the top 10 of all their books for the year and it literally cemented my relationship with them so when I want to do a book sign, I can I just call them up. They 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 want me to come whatever I can come because and whatever because they know they're going to get people and you're going to sell out like hotcakes. And now that we develop a, a program that was going to be fun for the kids, so everything to me has to be top notch. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is not that I'm top notch, but I want to put in the effort so I know the kids are going to have fun. I know that the parents are going to enjoy it. I know when people leave, we're going to have them to leave with something. If it's mm. just a, a book a marker or something, something they can take with them. So right. everything that you do, if you're out here trying to write books or create content, you got to put, you got to think about how can it be the best? Put that extra effort into it to make sure you stand out. Sure. And so I took that stuff from, I took the stats from Karibu and went to Borders and Barnes and & Noble. Mm. And they said no. no. Uh, Barnes and Noble said no twice. Borders said no three times. And if you get to know me, I don't believe in no. 
And that is mean, borders, not right now. Just, is borders still open? They're, they're I don't done. Know if they're, they're, they're done. Yeah, they, they, were like the, they were mismanaged. I used to go to the one on uh, 34th Street in New York. That was my borders that I love to go to to pick up books for my, my students uh, when I taught in New York City. And um, it was, uh, yeah, when they, they closed up and that whole chain, I think. Shut went, down. Yeah. And it was bad because borders, if it had not been mismanaged, was probably the better of all the three other books as far as environment. And yeah. sitting in and reading. Sure. Um, here's another lesson if you're out here pushing it. If you really know you have something great, don't listen to what anybody else is saying. Because all the experts told me it wasn't going to sell. Uh, quick story about borders. So I went to Book Expo. You familiar with Book Expo? Oh, the big book expo, yeah. the one at the Javits yep. Center, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. for me, I always think in terms of being a New Yorker, and there was always at the it Javits sure Center in New York. Okay. And they did, they did one time in California, okay. but right. and most of it, it happened in New York. So at the Book Expo, the small press department was there. Right. right? And so I already been rejected twice already from them. Mm -hmm. And so they had an open forum to ask questions. And so, of course, being me, I was like, <laughs> I got a question. <laughs> and they were like, what's your question? I was like, why do you keep rejecting my book? <laughs> and they were like, what do you mean? Does it fit this format? I said, it fits that format. Does it do that? Yes. I had yes all the questions. I said, and I found a way to sell an independent borders because the managers have, if you're in Ingram or just a distributor, right. they can order your book. Yeah. So I went to the managers and I was like, well, give me like give me a week. Put it at the register. I started selling like crazy. Same thing happened. They would sell out, sell out, sell out. And so I went to them, I was like, so I'm trying to understand why you keep rejecting me and I'm selling out in your stores. Right. Not in black bookstores, but your stores. What was their answer? They didn't have an answer. And then the lady who, she said, she wanted to, of course, cross because I was causing commotion. So she was like, sure. let's talk about this offline. So I got a phone number. And she's like, you know, I just don't think it's right for our store. I said, you know, only thing I can understand, only thing I feel like is happening here is still like that because it's a black book. Is that is that the reason why it's happening? Right. No, 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 no. It's not. That's, that's not the reason. I said, well, if I fill out the criteria and I've sold out in three, your, your stores already what make i don't understand what criteria you're using to block me from being on the shelves because they want people are used to that old you know you've got the agent the publisher they're not trying to do business with you they want it with your gatekeeper right where where's your gatekeeper that that keeps the gate right you get by all those people to us right they're used to dealing with, with the gatekeeper and that's a very good point about it. That's a very good point. And I think uh, once I challenged her, we got placed in 100 stores. Whoa. Uh, oh. Yeah. So, uh, and we did a book tour to eight cities You're and sold out in six of them. Tired, yeah, but <laughs> I need you as my publishing consultant because, you know what? I don't currently really actively promote my books, not because I don't want to. I'm just so busy that a lot of times I'm like, oh, if I post this book people are going to say but that's not new why is she still promoting but sometimes i'm like do well you should just post it i have friends still on facebook that are like where's the link to your book right and i'm like oh here you go like because i don't actively i promote other people more than i do myself more in terms of my product my books and stuff and but to your point you're it sounds to me like you're saying do not take no for an answer and figure out a way to get a, you know, to get from that, that next, from where you're at to that next point that's right, you know, in front of you. In other right. words, don't don't think about all the reasons why it's a, a clear no. I always say look for leverage because you know your market, you should know your market better than anybody else, right? So you have to find ways, the same way that I was talking about the reporter. You gotta think about other people's perspectives. Like, why would it be important to them? Not why, not why they should do it. Not why it'd be the right thing for them to do. What would make them move? In How, other words, what's the hook for them? What's exactly. the draw? What's the exactly? Okay. And you can change that lens and start to drill on that, and then maximize it. So mm -hmm. if you we, we'll move from to Super CJ, so. I was trying to convince the guy to give me a hundred thousand okay. dollars to do the animation. Sure. Right? So I, I had to prove there was a market for it. 
and how do you go about doing that let me and so yeah so, but let me let you know and, and give a shout out to the audience so i have a, I had a few folks that said some really nice things here since you've been on the live oh wow 